Greetings, everyone, and welcome to this session on the economics of women's health. And thank you to the WEF for making this a mainstream session uh, at the World Economic uh, Forum. Uh, it's held, of course, in the context of uh, the WEF's uh, Women's Health Initiative. And that initiative was, uh, was launched with the aim of obviously contributing to the health and well-being of the world's 3.9 billion uh, women and uh, girls. Now, it, it seems that we cannot state too often the case for investment in the health of women and girls. All the evidence tells us that obviously not only is, is it a good thing in its own right for women and girls, but it contributes to the overall economic performance of, of countries, of families, that healthier women uh, are part of more successful, more educated, more productive societies, uh, that families with improved uh, reproductive and maternal health uh, are families which uh, can report uh, higher earnings in the longer run, that every dollar we spend uh, on family planning services, and Natalia no doubt will talk more about this, uh, just has so many return uh, benefits in, in many ways for health uh, and economies. Uh, so all up, it's a good thing, but why isn't there more of it is then the question that uh, immediately follows. And I guess those are some of the issues we want to explore with our panel today. Let's also acknowledge what an appalling setback COVID has been uh, for uh, the health and well-being of women and girls, uh, not only in uh, loss of access uh, during lockdowns in many countries to reproductive and, and sexual health services, but also the many millions of girls that we're told will never go back to school uh, after the lockdowns because of impoverishment of families, that the domestic violence that came from it, that the list is long. So we've got setbacks and we've got big challenges with the Sustainable Development Goals and gender equality. But let's hope from the combined wisdom of our panel today, we can go away with some, some insights and ideas as to how things can be speeded along. So, wonderful panel. I have right next to me the Minister of Women and Child Development of India. Uh, next to the Minister is Kevin Ali, Chief Executive Officer and Member of the Board of Organon. Then, next to Kevin, uh, Natalia Kanem uh, of the UN Population Fund, Executive uh, Director, and way along the end, almost out of sight, but definitely not out of mind, <laughs> is Mark Sussman, uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And let's acknowledge what tremendous supporters the Gates Foundation has been of investing in women and girls. So, Minister, uh, can we start with you? Uh, there's a need to have high-level political engagement in order to create a healthier, gender-equitable and child-centred world. Tell us from your perspective why you think investing in women and girl-child development should be such a priority. I think that if we lead from example and expressions of many a policy interventions in India with respect to health per se, there are a few takeaways from that experience. The world's largest and uh, one of the most expansive healthcare programs in India is currently underway called the Ayushman Bharat Yojana, which covers 100 million families from marginalized communities, from low income group communities. They encompass close to services in 26,000 hospitals across the country, where the government gives free support for medical support in over 1,300 diseases, and at the same time, what it does is that it is transferable with a migration of people from one region to another geography. What it also does is, as it covers the huge expanse of the healthcare needs of those who are marginalized, it also brings to fore many an achievements which have a societal impact or which have an impact with regards to some cultural narratives. I'll give you a very small example. Uh, People believed that in Indian society, issues such as breast cancer, cancer of the cervix, are not issues that will be popularly spoken of because women would be not as aggressive about their healthcare needs or, for that matter, in this segment, not get the adequate support that they so desire. One of the outcomes of the health program called Ayushman Bharat is that in the past one, one and a half years, numbers suggest, 
that over 130 million Indian women, because of the support of this very program, have reached out to medical facilities across the country, gotten themselves scanned for cancer of the cervix and cancer of the breast. After scanning, if they are in need of a medical intervention, have received that support from these medical institutions. Now, this is a number which is unheard of, especially in a segment of medication where people feel that we will not be so culturally exposed, which means that another interesting insight it throws up is that when women are enabled in terms of access and fiscal support, there is not a single healthcare need that they will not address themselves. The other aspect, uh, which becomes a huge burden in terms of the financial aspects of any family unit, is when you spend on pharmacology. And the Prime Minister was extremely keen to ensure that there is an available infrastructure in every district and every block of India which makes sure that any medicine that you need, be it for cardiovascular diseases, be it for diabetes, be it even a stent, it is available at prices which are affordable. Now that means when you enable a family to save on pharmacy needs, that is an added plus to the family's income. Now, in that matrix, there is a special disposition for 40 female health-related products. Um, let me give you a small example. Never in the history of my country, from the ramparts of the Red Fort on Independence Day, has any prime minister spoken of the availability of a sanitary pad for yeah. one rupee. Yeah. Yeah. That a male prime minister, and uh, with all my respects to the gender that I'm speaking of, could give India our first menstrual hygiene administrative protocol. So when we talk about how to uh, put the gender agenda at the forefront of healthcare, do we only take the refuge of, let's say, an insurance-based program like Ayushman Bharat? No. Where is the legislative uh, need or gap that needs to be filled to complement our efforts of gender justice? For four decades in my country, there was a bill pending uh, legislative support, which uh, basically pronounced support through administration and medical communities for medical termination of pregnancy at 24 weeks. That it passed both houses of parliament without a whimper from any man or any political entity speaks volume about the maturity of the Indian populace and polity with regards to medical needs for women. That we have now enhanced maternity benefit for working women to up to 26 weeks is also something that we celebrate as women in my country. Uh, apart from that, I think that there is a conscious effort on behalf of the government to ensure that the whole life cycle needs of a woman's health is looked after by every government entity. For example, I lead the gender ministry in India. We run the world's largest nutrition program in the world. The prime minister started a flagship program, which is an amalgam of 18 ministries in the government of India. It's never happened before. And we, through our technology engagement, service the needs and nutritional delivery at the doorsteps for 120 million Indian women and children below the age of six. It is a collaboration between citizens and government, but it is a collaboration which has done us well, especially in the pandemic. Um, Ms. Clark, with your permission, given the time constraints, let me just expand beyond uh, the relevance of, let's say, Ayushman Bharat. Uh, Many a times we define health needs as the immediate health needs of a woman that needs to be addressed. There are evolutions in health needs, especially given our labor markets, especially given women in distress. So the prime minister led the establishment of emergency and crisis centers for women, particularly in every district of my country. There are 703 such emergency crisis centers which are currently functional, which were open for business even during the global lockdown, where we finance additionally 35 women's helplines. And we have combined in our federal structure helped close to 220 million women in distress, given them medical, uh, psychological, um, and police help so that they can transition from challenges towards solutions. So if we look at the needs of women, not only from, let's say, issues of uh, cardiovascular diseases, menstrual health, but even mental health, 
that is a huge prospect where we can see enhanced partnerships between the private sector and those who are policy makers. Mm. When you invest in the health of a woman, you invest in the health of a community because she's not singular to keeping or restraining that benefit to herself. When you empower her financially, she tends to spend more on health and education. So let's look at healthcare from both perspectives, not only from the infrastructural engagement, but also when we fiscally empower women in other segments of society, we give them more purchasing power in the health sector. Well, thank you very much for putting all of those issues on the table, and there's clearly very important elements of universal health coverage that you've talked about, and also universal basic uh, social protection as, as well. And uh, great to see the attention to the silent killers like breast cancer and cervical cancer, and also the, the cause of menstrual hygiene, which as we know is the lack of it uh, keeps so many girls out of continuing with their schooling, which is disastrous. So thank you, thank you so much for those insights. Uh, Kevin, uh, let's come uh, to you as Chief Executive Officer and member of the Organon uh, Board. Uh, gender equity and women's health are intrinsically entwined in the success of societies, but we've seen women's health isn't always prioritised. From your perspective, why has progress been a bit slow? Uh, and just make any comments you'd like to make about how you, know, you see this changing. Well, thank you for the, the question. I, I would tell you that we could spend quite a bit of time just discussing that very topic, and I'll try to be concise from the point of view of the biopharmaceutical sector, which I, I'm a, a leader of, of one of those companies in Organon. Look, the you know sustainable development goals in terms of things like reduction of maternal mortality, um, over the last 17 years, it's an average of about three point, about three percentage points a year reduction. When SDG, you know, basically says that um, um, it should be about six percent. When we look at unintended pregnancy rates uh, globally, they're about 50 percent. 50 percent, five out of every 10 pregnancies were unintended, and so we all know that for many girls and many women that could basically lead them astray from being able to have their own development and their own opportunities in life in terms of education and opportunities to, to go after. Postpartum hemorrhage, a woman dies every three minutes somewhere in the world from the complication of delivery, uh, which shouldn't be the case. Preterm labor, there's about a million children a year that are born in a preterm labor state and the complications and the more mortality and the morbidity associated with preterm labor, not enough innovation has really actually been generated uh, and, and focused on some of these things in, in terms of maternal care, in terms of reproductive health, for example, unintended pregnancies, in, in terms of uh, a number of areas. Even I'll, I'll throw out fertility. One would think that IVF therapies should be something that can solve some of the fertility needs around the world, but when you look today, even at the Asian Pacific countries, in the Asian Pacific Rim, you need 2.1 um, in terms of per family, in terms of reproducing the, the population. In Korea, it's 0.7. Uh, by, the end of the, by the end of the century, Korea will be half the size of, as it is today. You can see some of the issues. You, you read in the Wall Street Journal, we talked, Natalia and I talked about this, that China is actually about 1.5. China is having a population issue. So all of that tells you that there's needed investment in, in the opportunities to bring innovation in that space. And that's where the idea of Organon was kind of born, uh, to essentially be a company that has many businesses, but the direction of travel is really about investment in, in women's health, to increase the investment in innovation. If I give you a sobering statistic, of the 37 uh, products that were approved by the FDA last year, only three were essentially targeting those conditions unique to women. So there's much more that needs to be there. Now, here's the good news. The good news is there, there are green shoots of innovation across the world, uh, ranging from kind of the fast emerging area of femtech all the way to therapeutic uh, advances as well. We ourselves at Organon have actually, since the year and a half we've been live, since we rang the bell at the New York Stock Exchange, um, we've done eight deals, two in the medical device space, 
one to solve the issues of postpartum hemorrhage, one to solve the issue of some of the issues around minimally invasive uh, hysterectomies, all the way to new mechanism of action, uh, new mechanisms of action for endometriosis, preterm labor, polycystic ovary syndrome. Those are areas we're investing in because investment is the key. Now, the reason there hasn't been investment over the years is, is very simple. Um, our industry, the pharmaceutical industry, is usually not gender focused. They're agnostic of that. They actually focus on the innovation in the R&D space, whoever it actually um, uh, supports. But we feel there are opportunities at, at Organon to really invest in women's health, not only reproductive health, not only maternal health, but in gynecological um, uh, conditions as well. Because the industry needs to see, yes, we believe this is a noble cause, but is it a viable, sustainable commercial enterprise? Mm -hmm. And if commercially there are more and more innovations and more and more return on that investment, then it, it will serve as almost a magnet. It will magnetize the industry to start investing more in areas of women's health, both distinctly women's health as well as those conditions uniquely or disproportionately actually impacting women, everything from celiac disease to chronic cough to migraine to osteoporosis. More needs to be done in this space. That's the bottom line. There are green shoots of innovation. I think Organon is being one that actually rings the bell that you can have a noble cause and sustainable, viable commercial enterprise that ultimately can feed itself so that ultimately it can go forward. Because any time we think of women's health as some sort of corporate social responsibility, it'll go up and it'll go down depending on the time that we're in. But if it's a viable commercial enterprise, then it will be there for the long term. Mm. Thank you, Kevin. And coming to uh, Natalia, uh, do you see green shoots? <laughs> Are we going to overcome the barriers? I see green shoots precisely because women are no longer taking a back seat. And as half the world's population, the demands on the political system, and I think we've had beautiful examples of transformation when women's needs are prioritized, as well as the understanding that women themselves are stepping up to lead on these issues. I think the examples that uh, Kevin just put on the table for Organon, in terms of the wealth of possibility, monetary wealth, but also wealth in terms of health as wealth. So from my perspective, looking at certain barriers of why are women's needs not prioritized brings us back to this issue of making the case, but making the case with evidence is not always enough. So the transformation of the understanding of especially an adolescent girl, of her human rights, of her self-worth, of her uh, right to exist in a digital space, of her right to not only uh, lead but to consume products that are good for her and for her mental health. These are the uh, green shoots that not just the private sector, but us as United Nations, as public sector, as regular citizens, as fathers who support daughters, we all have to embrace. So it is disturbing that as we look across the spectrum of lack of priority, COVID-19 told us everything we need to know about a health workforce that's almost three quarters female and Midwives that UNFPA support were scrambling for raincoats and other mm -hmm. manner of PPE-like barriers to be able to treat people in distress. Um, as has been alluded to, the life cycle of women from prenatal, where nutrition is crucial and important, all the way to older age. And in a world of eight billion, many of us are aging, but many women are voting with their feet when it comes to the size of their family. I advocate, of course, for family planning, and we've seen the wisdom and the high return of almost $10 for every dollar you invest in family planning and maternal health. So the monetary case can be made. But you also need to make the case for uh, at a time when there is so much uh, heterogeneity and uh, different experiences in countries, there are still 300 million women who want to access family planning that are knocking on the door of a clinic and nobody is there. So looking at universal health care as one of the keynote uh, examples of sustainable development, 
the woman who wants to limit her family size has to be catered to, as well as the woman who's stigmatized because of infertility, or frankly, who's choosing not to have a first or second child because she can figure out the economics of trying to get a kid through school and college and the shoes and the books and everything else. So the role of innovation is going to be mission critical. My last point is on ge geographic disparity, and Minister, you alluded to this. Where you live, you could be at the top of the hill in an island location, your human right to health exists. So looking at geography and innovation and some of the tech solutions that we can use to overcome those sound barriers, but also just simple primary health care, this is what's going to make a difference for women. But listening to the voices of women who are saying, this is what we need, this is what we want, and we're not going to wait 100 years for the wage situation to equalize, et cetera, that's going to be the accelerator that, uh, that we need. Mm. Thank you, Natalia. And of course, in those years of waiting you're referring to, it's the WEF's own uh, Global Gender Gap a report, which uh, the figures for the year before the pandemic showed 100 years to full gender equality. Then we have the horror year of 2020, reported on the 2021 report, which said 136 years, because that's how much things had regressed for women. And then the, mo the latest one, based on the, the 2021 data, uh, says 132 years. So we're impatient, aren't we? We don't think that's an appropriate time to wait for full equality. <laughs> but the investments in this kind of area are part of what's going to make the, the difference. And that leads me to come to Mark Sussman and say, Mark, from the perspective of the, the Gates Foundation, what do you think are the most critical global health investments to be made now for women and girls? Yeah, so, well, thank you and uh, thanks to the panel for already raising so many of the critical issues. And actually where Helen started, you know, it remains this paradox. Even here we are at, at sort of Davos who's thinking about global pr prosperity writ large where we know there is no single investment or set of investments beyond investing in the health education and agency of girls and women that has a better social and economic payoff, full stop. That, that's an uncontested fact. Uh, but yet, as a community, whether it's from the Davos agendas to uh, the representation to the time frame of 132 versus 136 years, uh, it's as a world we are not remotely close to where we could or should be. And so that does pull you into, well, where and how are the investments that could and should be prioritized and shifted? And mm -hmm. at the Gates Foundation, we've actually been through our own uh, sort of learning on where we've always prioritized health and women's health from our foundation, from, from our establishment as a foundation in 2000. We've learned ourselves that we actually haven't always gone around it in a way that appropriately both listens to the needs of stakeholders, brings in the communities, targets particular opportunities need and you want to look at it across the spectrum so at one level you know one of the sets of investments exactly what the minister was just talking about in India and India has been a model in many ways of some of the things from the development of tools like women's self-help groups and empowerment collectives that are able to you know collectively provide agency that get you health and financial and economic uh, outputs and we think that is an incredibly important tool that uh, can and should be uh, spread in other parts of the world, whether it's that linkage in on nutrition that we talked about because nutrition is such a critical enabler for both you know, healthy pregnancies, healthy birth, uh, prevention of morbidity, and then providing those opportunities for later schools and access. Uh, but then more broadly, the kind of medical interventions we talked about, and this is how we've evolved our own thinking. So, for example, uh, there's both our into the core research and development. Let's take an area where we are prioritizing significant investment right now is there are treatments for anemia, but investment in anemia, which actually you know, is one of the most fundamental challenges facing uh, women, and particularly women in pregnancy, uh, and the related effect on it, is far, far short of what could and should be being done. So we are trying to pick areas like that where we think there are promising new interventions and new science that can be as priorities. Similarly, in the area of nutrition, the better understanding of the microbiome, which there are lots of companies sort of doing expanded research in to figure out how to do better weight loss, but our research can focus specifically in what elements of treating the microbiome can actually be 
you know, most important in the antenatal and postnatal period for women and children? And can you have, again, some transformative investments? And we actually think the potential there is huge. And so mm -hmm. that's the kind of example of scientific areas where a foundation like ours mm -hmm. can prioritize and target research and development, which is not naturally going mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. from private companies or others, even though you know, mm -hmm. arguably it could or should be, mm -hmm. but we think could have a disproportionate effect. Mm -hmm. But it's not just the development of the products. It's also then the distribution and pricing and access. As Natalia was talking about, mm -hmm. some of that uh, access of need, say, in family planning, is how can you spread a different uh, array of uh, family planning products to make sure that women have full availability of choice. Mm -hmm. There we've had partnerships, including with UNFPA, where you take some existing products, which we know are of increasing popularity, such as injectable mm -hmm. um, contraceptives. And what we would work with was a couple of private sector companies who didn't think there were markets in uh, low and lower middle income countries. And so we would arrange some deals that would include, in this case, there were volume guarantees saying, we think uh, there is a market. So if you halve the price of your product, uh, we will guarantee as the Gates Foundation to make up if you don't actually make a profit at that price and reach your market. They made a profit, they met their market, twice as many women got access to the product as they would. Mm -hmm. There are also ways in which you can uh, produce or distribute the treatment or prioritize the treatment of uh, new interventions. We mentioned cervical cancer. You know, the HPV mm -hmm. vaccine is a critical mm -hmm. uh, vaccine that um, has been developed and rolled out uh, across much of the world and is trying to, it's, it's well short of what's needed as a major priority of Gavi. There's some exciting new products, including product research from some Indian and other companies around it. At the Gates Foundation, we were able to provide and do some research as a public good, which showed the efficacy of a single dose of HPV is as much as uh, the current thing of multiple doses. That basically allows you to vaccinate twice as many children for the same amount of Again, it's a study that anybody could or should have done, potentially. Uh, but it's an area where when you step in in a gap in the public good, that allows you to actually reach many more women. So it's that combination of trying to identify both you know, the key areas of research and development, then the access of the products, and then last but not least, and maybe you know, this can come back to that with the uh, rest of the panel, is that how do you then arrange the delivery of it through the public health systems, through systems like uh, you know, India's significant networks and the Ayushman Bharat program, through other tools, because that's that last mile. It actually has to reach the women and children that uh, need to get access. Mm. Yes, and indeed a, a role of foundations, I think, to look for those niches which aren't being picked up necessarily by others and, and show what can and can be done. So thank you for those those insights. I'd like to bring our, our audience in. Uh, we've got a, a full room and <laughs> the hands are going up already <laughs> and we'll be gender equal in what we take. So there, you're first and you're next. <laughs> Please introduce yourselves. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. And maybe do you want to uh, wait for the microphone and maybe stand up so people can see you sure. as well. Hello everyone. I'm Sangu Delhi from Ghana and I'm a healthcare entrepreneur. I run a tech forward healthcare system with 65 hospitals and clinics across Africa and we serve a million patients. So um, when it comes to this issue of, of uh, women's health in particular, on the African continent, we're about 1.3 billion today. Um, we're about 15, 16% of global population, yet we're responsible for 25% of the global disease burden. Mm -hmm. We only have 3% of global healthcare workers and 1% of global healthcare expenditure. Yet, if you look at uh, demographic projections, by 2050, one in four people globally will be African. 70% of the world's youth globally are going to be in Africa. In fact, more people are going to enter the workforce in Africa that year than the rest of the world combined. So literally over the next two decades and change, we expect over a billion babies to be born in Africa. Yet, um, if we look at what's happening with our doctor to patient ratio and the chronic shortages that are starting to happen in the West, every single day, the biggest challenge I have in my hospitals are doctors and nurses being poached mm -hmm. to go overseas. Yet we're the continent that needs these resources the most. So pragmatically speaking, what can we do to ensure 
that the continent that is going to be the world's future and is going to produce the future workforce will be able to have the right infrastructure and the right personnel to be able to build a healthcare future. Thank you. Natalia, can I give you a go at that one? Well, it's, you've absolutely succinctly gotten to the heart of the matter, which is equity and also the question of the future of the global world, because Africa, in a sense, leads in the disease burden, but also the innovation, the imagination, and those young people who have to be equipped also come from Africa, and Asia, too, will be part of the burgeoning uh, uh, population increase. But the rights and choices of uh, an individual girl, but also of the nurse, the doctor, et cetera, being buttressed at home makes so much more sense than trying to export them and or play the catch up. So the uh, wisdom of the African Minister of Finance, the health system, uh, universal health coverage system of building a workforce, for example, midwives who were trying to double the, uh, the, the availability of midwifery, looking at primary care but also making it more attractive for the workforce, and many of them, the preponderance of them being female, is part of the solutions orientation that uh, our panel represents today. And I think that solution is coming from private sector actors who are the uh, bulwark of the health system in Africa like everywhere else. So the donated uh, contraception that UNFPA provides is all very well and good, but women are paying for services. So thank you for the question, and I think that really well summarizes the uh, urgency of the types of innovation and social policy that we tried to put on the table. Christina. So, uh, thank you. Can you hear me? OK. Yes, yes. I'm Christina Lloyd, uh, and I am I'm the global leader of the Fairings uh, Reproductive Medicine Maternal Health Portfolio. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank all of you here. We, and I'm really happy that Faring is a part of um, co championing this uh, forum's uh, flagship, this initiative, which we're really proud of being here. And I also would like to thank you know, Organon for rejoining uh, joining us here and, and, and together, and then you and, and uh, UNFPA and, and, and uh, Howard School of, of uh, Public Health. So that's fantastic. So we are here in this coalition to try to work together. And I think we are sitting here, every, and everything we say, because say, should nobody say no, we don't need that. Why don't we turn everything upside down? Like, we have to create a common narrative. And this is also what we are doing in this coalition. And we are also creating a white paper based on data, investments cases, and we are trying to build business models that everyone can understand. So, and, and um, I would also like to say that, listen to everyone here, I, I'm a gynecologist and obstetrician myself. I've actually been saving, let's say, lives during my days. And then I was in, you know, healthcare with good equipment, medicine and everything. So I do understand this is the purpose. And this is also what we as actually competitors are working together. And this <laughs> is the beauty of it, I think. Mm -hmm. So my question is, back to the narrative, that how can we do that to even more create this clarity of why it is a smart thing to invest in women's and girls' health. It's not about the cost. We're not talking about cost of healthcare. We are talking about investment in healthcare. Mm -hmm. And we were at this meeting this morning, the same thing again. So can you please tell me what could the narrative, what could the story be to ministers of health and, and head of states and CEOs and so on around the world so we can create a common narrative because we all have our stories and I'm so impressed to listening to what you're doing. And, and so once again, how can we create that and what could this question be and how can, what can we ask them to do? Well, I'm going to throw that question to the Minister of Women and Child Development of India because, because <laughs> listening, listening to you, Minister, I, I think there have been, there've been some very compelling arguments which have uh, loosened the purse strings to do important things. I, so. think, I think it's not about loosening the purse strings. It is about spending what is in the purse mindfully. Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are two, three things that I'd like to hear flag, Christina. Um, one is... Do we look at healthcare very myopically? Can there be a bigger narrative around women's health? 
Let me give you another Indian example. The Prime Minister in 2014, when he took office, spoke again very unusually about a very unglamorous subject, which was that, can we build toilets for women? Mm. Now, when he said that, uh, he spoke not only from a perspective of sanitation, health care, he spoke about it from an education point of view, as mm. Helena said, that there are many girls who drop out the minute mm. they are part of the menstrual cycle age. Mm. In one year, we built toilets in every government school in the country. We curtailed dropouts. However, on a larger scale, the government built 110 million individual household toilets. Now, people would presume that there's a health benefit to it. In the 2000 year 13, there was a World Bank report that because of lack of sanitation services, there is a negative burden of 6% on Indian GDP. So while he was addressing a gender justice issue, he ended up addressing an economic issue, mm -hmm. but also a law and order issue. Because there were reports out there in, in public that 40% of sexual violence took place when women went out to defecate. Mm -hmm. So when we look at issues of women's health or women's dignity or justice, there is a multiply effect mm -hmm. when you try and reach one solution. Mm -hmm. Now, apart from losing up the purse strings, it is about partnerships. So Mark has very eloquently spoken about what the Gates Foundation has done. But what is significant about what he said is that they help fund the confidence that is needed to transition from failure to success. To say that injectables will find a wider market till such time a partnership uh, evolves from, let's say, a foundation like the Gates Foundation, supporting industry, impacting policymakers. I think we need more and more players who will bridge that gap. So apart from only looking at an initiative on women's health from the myopia of mm. possible infrastructure, from the myopia of only policy making, it is us on this panel who are a part of the solution. No individual entity in governance or the capital market or corporate infrastructure can be the answer alone. Mm. I also feel that another my myopia that we are inflicted by is uh, when we talk about women's health, we speak about women from a constituency of consumption. Mm. How many of us are very focused on health innovators who are women, who do frontier breakthrough work on research, but do not know how to convert those innovations into enterprise? Because there are many and entrepreneurial ventures, innovations which are cost effective given the diversity of geographies, which are um, culturally easier to ingest by many countries when they evolve very organically from communities. How much of our concentration from a healthcare perspective is even on those innovations? Um, lastly, from a talent point of view, I had gentlemen uh, speak about the African challenge. How do you address that challenge from an academic perspective? Uh, we in India, under the Prime Minister's leadership now, have institutionalized healthcare education in every district of the country. Not only doctors, paramedics, nursing communities, those who are indulging in telemedicine. It is a huge ecosystem that needs to evolve and find successive support across segments of policy making, governance, uh, civil society, and corporates. So if we start looking at the system as a whole and start addressing it as a coalition, Mark spoke about in India a coalition of women who are entrepreneurial in nature, 80 million of them. Uh, they manage credit only within that segment of close to $32 billion every year. They are available in every village in India. They scale up and skill up on the supply chain from a crafts perspective, agro-processing perspective, but they become agents of change when it comes to health and when it comes to academics for women. So how do we find new resources for communication with regards to women's health? And lastly, speaking as a mother of two kids, um, what we do as women, irrespective of our financial uh, background, we tend to put ourselves last when it comes to our pharmacological needs and diagnostic needs.
no matter who you are, no matter where you are, you do this as a woman. Your diagnostics re uh, needs are the last refuge in your healthcare framework. So can we have more education and conversation around the diagnostic needs and the pharmacological needs? Because currently most of the conversation is about what do you do when you're in trouble? How much are we investing or how much are we strategizing with regards to preventive health care when it comes to women and young girls? Mm. Can I ask, do we have Cynthia McCaffrey in the room? Yes, Cynthia, from UNICEF. Now, let, take your question, Cynthia, and then I'll bring others in. Uh, my name is Cynthia McCaffrey. I work at UNICEF India, and I actually have worked, I feel like, for four of you on stage, because um, I've been at UNICEF for a long time, so UNDP, Gates, UNFPA. And now, in India, I work for the minister. Um, so, <laughs> so we're a partner, but we're very proud to um, help implement the um, incredible, very tangible initiatives that, as you talked about, um, Anyawandi, uh, frontline workers, for example, getting people trained. My question is picking up on this point about um, women are beneficiaries, but how to make them more of the shareholders um, and the decision makers around um, health care so that they're the real players when it comes to building this global health ecosystem. Mm. Let's start with Mark down the far end. I can still see you. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's a great uh, set of questions, and, and that is the fundamental issue. And, and you know, there's no one set of interventions. It, it's a whole scale of interventions from, you know, the models and examples that you do dress and bring in at a policy level with, you know, finance ministers and prime ministers, you know, who often don't have the... Uh, same kind of leadership that the minister was talking about in India need to be educated as to why and how this is so critically important and you can link in those economic issues. It's about proving the products and the models so that you can show that that's true whether you're at a district level, uh, whether you're uh, for the communities themselves, for mothers to know if you're you know, investing in this, in the nutrition of your children or whatever it might be, you're going to get these outcomes. And then you've got the tools and things available for them. But it's also about, you know, I started with that sense of a women's sense of, of sort of agency and purpose. And we know that that is still such a fundamental barrier for a whole range of those going well beyond healthcare. But to take one example, then you refer to that, you know, by putting all of our health areas together, our maternal child health areas, into a wider gender equality team, which we did a couple of years, linking it to our women's economic empowerment, it's allowed us, for example, to do work which we'd been meaning to do for a while, but it ended up being completely siloized for adolescent girls and young women, where you say for the agency for prevention, for example, we know that the highest incidence for HIV uh, incidence remains 16 to 24-year-old young girls and women, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. And, you know, the intervention, it's not simply about getting access to the PrEP tools. It's a set of behaviors, agencies, understanding the motivation, understanding the routes by which they might be able to access that kind of health care. And that's true because it's that same group needing to access family planning products. It's the same group we want to make sure are staying in school and being educated. Uh, it's the same group we want to be sure are perhaps joining some of those self-help groups as they come in more rural areas. It's the same group who we hope are getting a ladder in a bank account or agency and so on. And so I think, you know, there's a short-term sets of interventions around those specific things, but there's also just the long-term connective tissue of building those connections and understanding that starts with basically providing power and agency to the women and girls themselves, because that's the best way of demanding those outcomes and results. Time is always against us, and we could get so much more from this panel and from the, the audience, uh, which we really don't have time for. But I think we've had a, a wonderful mix of the practical examples from the Minister of what can be done. Uh, Kevin loved your sort of, you know, can do, there's opportunities to innovate in this area. Uh, UNFPA and Natalie are always out there, you know, advocating, making the case, uh, and, and actually delivering in real time to so many. And Mark, uh, you know, Gates out there looking for the neglected areas and how to support uh, uh, women and girls uh, in this area. So some great takeaways. Um, I'm going to call on Shyam, who's the head of the healthcare practice here at the WEF, for his concluding comments. Thank you, Helen.
And uh, as you said, we are out of time, so I'm going to be very quick here. First of all, thank you for moderating such an excellent panel discussion. I mean, we're so glad to hear from you, Minister Irani, from Kevin, CEO of Arganon, from Natalia, UNFPA, from Mark Sussman, uh, CEO of Foundation. So you can see Gates Foundation. So you can see you have the public sector, private sector, United Nations, and the charity philanthropic organization here. So bringing all this together, listening to you, that excites me. Yeah. That tells me that we are thinking about women's health. We are going to do something about it. So this is an exciting time. One thing I would like to just bring it to your attention, especially to you, Minister Irani, and we were discussing this earlier today in a healthcare policy session. We had two health ministers. We had the health minister from Germany. We had the health minister from uh, India. And we had a few finance ministers. We had the uh, ex-prime minister of UK, uh, Tony Blair, there in that session. And it was very clear that now we are talking about investing in healthcare. Mm -hmm. We are talking about, especially the finance ministers, they were talking about healthcare in, as investment and not as a cost. Yeah. So this is really good to hear. Mm -hmm. I want to hear the same thing for women's health, yeah. that it is an investment. Yeah. And like our ex-Secretary General Kofi Annan, UN Secretary General said, investing in women is reducing poverty. That's right. So that is very important, and it's happening now. So on the G20 side, I know India is, the, yeah. is holding presidency for G20 mm -hmm. for this year. We have been talking to Ministry of Health and, and, and Welfare. I think it would be great for us, all of us, to lobby to highlight women's health as one of the health agenda for G20. Mm -hmm. So that would be my request to you. Done. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I know we are out of time. So I would like to thank everyone for being thank here.